Um, my name is Dan Newman. I'm the Chief Technology Officer for Honeywell's UAS UAM division. I began as a mechanical engineer, undergraduate degree, planned to go into the mobility industry and ended up at Boeing. And they asked me if I'd go to their helicopter division. And as I'm walking around my first day, I'm at the flight ramp and there's a Chinook, you know, 53,000 pound helicopter hovering 100 feet off the ground, nose down. It's got four landing gear. It looks like a cat being held by the scruff of its neck. And I could feel it beating in my chest. And uh, I was transfixed and I was just awestruck by that capability to hover. It wasn't just, you know, a couple hundred thousand parts flying in formation, but they were rock steady. It was incredible and I was hooked. So I've been uh, just a fan of vertical flight since. It's been an incredibly complex and rewarding time. I drew brackets, uh, but I found I wasn't suited to the detailed design work. I didn't have the patience for it, uh, but I could sketch. This was before computers. The drafting boards came up to here and the smoke came down to here and all you could see was a sea of white short sleeve button down shirts and thin black ties. Um, and I could sketch and I did uh, isometric drawings by hand for the tech pubs and they decided they'd make me the apprentice for the configuration designer who had about 45 years in the business but was losing his eyesight. It's an extraordinary opportunity and I learned at the knee of one of the best and I moved, worked my way to be the configuration designer for a new Army Scout attack helicopter that became the Comanche. Had an extraordinary opportunity. A um, couple years working on that in partnership with Sikorsky and then left the company to start a small startup and go to grad school, get an aero degree because I felt I needed that background to continue in the field. So I got a degree in aero mechanics at the University of Maryland and my old boss dragged me back to go do more demonstrators and um, technology developments and risk reduction activity. Spent a lot of years doing that. I was really fortunate, worked on some great things, civil and military developments. And I had six years at DARPA for the Defense Department, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. Um, new technology, breaking paradigms, real extraordinary opportunity. Ended up going back to Boeing for another 17 years. Uh, it's, been a, it's been a long ride, but it's been incredible. I started in the vertical flight portion of Boeing and uh, was fortunate to become part of their technical fellowship, an associate technical fellow and then a tech fellow and eventually a senior tech fellow. I spent some time in advanced concepts for commercial. Um, and that fellowship gave me the opportunity to work on an extraordinary range of projects at some level from seabed to space. Um, the systems engineering perspective could be applied to so many different domains and I was fortunate to dabble in almost all of them. Within Boeing, the fellowship is a set of credentials so it's not a role uh, or a specific job function, it's credentials that recognize you're a technical resource um, with breadth, perspective, contributing to the, uh, to the enterprise and to the industry and at some level to the, the national and global standards for advancement of the technology. So the fellowship is a set of credentials that that gives you the opportunity to um, uh, participate. It, it, it signals to others that you, you've got the perspective that can help. It opens doors. Um, so the fellowship's primary role was technical integrity, um, separate perspective than the business piece. Still important, but the focus is on technical integrity. The fellowship didn't affect the, the day to day. It was credentials that reflected at me as an individual and I'd bring those with me and it did give me the opportunity to to um, dabble to spend okay. more time working other programs and support other programs as well got involved with the VFS uh, subsequently ended up being a chapter officer filled almost every role in my local chapter and I ended up working up to have a national role as a deputy director, first a session chair and a committee chair, and then a deputy director for a number of years, and then eventually fortunate to be the technical director of the society for a couple of years. Uh, great experience. And then I was fortunate again to serve as the chair of the scholarship committee, getting exposure for four years, exposure to the VFF applicants, an extraordinary range of students applying. We, we never had enough uh, resources to reward all of them and inspire all of them to continue. Um, 
we tried. As a configuration designer, as a systems engineer, as an integrator, um, the biggest challenge is getting it right up front. Requirements, understanding, getting everyone on the same page, truly defining what we're trying to achieve. Because, um, you know, confusion is turbulence. Uh, requirements cre creates turbulence in the program. Requirements churn creates turbulence in the program. And so, you know, I'm driven to try and make sure we start right. Uh, and a part of that terminology is important. And I saw, I was frustrated by just the challenges of making sure we were communicating. We, you know, first, the disagreements weren't always because we disagreed on the content, but we weren't even using the same terms. I was motivated to talk to the executive director and uh, expressed my my concern. And Mike Hirschberg gave me the opportunity to write a column. I said, he said, write a letter. I said, uh, it's more than a letter to the editor. And he said, write an article. I said, uh, uh, that's too much. It's, I can't. Uh, he said, I'll give you a column. We'll do a column. And we're going to call it um, Coming to Terms and address terminology, try and get everyone on the same page. Uh, in some cases, it's where people are using the same term differently. In some cases, where there needs to be a term and there isn't one. Um, he agreed with me on the condition that I, my first column was on the thing that concerned him the most, flying cars. So I agreed and I wrote the article on flying cars, the column. And uh, I've had the fortune to have a column ever since in each VertiFlight, just talking about terminology. And in some ways, I'm, uh, I attempt to be incendiary. An old manager once said to me, if you're not drawing flack, you're not over the target. So. Uh, I'm not professing to know the answer, and, and some of this terminology has to be consensus among the industry. So my goal was to get a conversation started. And so I write the article in a way that attempts to define a term, but also invite rebuttal. Um, it's been successful. It's been rewarding. Um, knowing people read it and agree is great. Um, I'm not getting as much pushback as I thought I would, so I'm either on target or so far off, it's not worth their time. But it's been a great experience. And I've been fortunate in my involvement with the Vertical Flight Society, AHS National, now the VFS. I had a lot of chance to get some perspective. Was involved in the 75th Forum 75 we did in Philadelphia, and we, we were looking back at how it started at the Franklin Institute uh, for Forum 1 and 2. Um, and talk a lot about historians and what it was like and how far we've come. I'm also on the board of the American Helicopter Museum and Education Center, which gives me yet another great perspective. That was started at the 50th anniversary of the AHS. It was one of the ideas to come up with honoring the 50th anniversary, but it was decided to be a separate entity so it could be spo uh, sponsored and supported by more societies. So the legacy of the museum is part of the VFS history. And uh, so I've been involved with the museum and involved with the VFS, and it's amazing how far we've come in terms of the tools and the capability. We have data, you know, they talk about machine learning. We've got data that allows us to have trends and, and track the state of the art and really know that we're doing better and look back at what really were generational shifts. Um, it's still, uh, frustrating to be the redheaded stepchild of aviation, which is the redheaded step stepchild now of aerospace. You know, big money goes to space and smaller money goes to aviation, and only a fraction of it goes to vertical lift. And but the urban air mobility is is resurrecting the recognition that runway independence is an incredible capability. For years, people have said to me, you know, why are helicopters so heavy? Every aircraft design trade is an onboard, offboard trade. Should I carry that with me or should I leave it at the vertiport? Should I make the airplane a little heavier and have more adaptability or should I rely on others? And vertical flight is just a runway trade, onboard versus offboard. I either rely on a runway being there or I make a more complex aircraft that doesn't need one. And so comparing Vertical flight to airplanes is like comparing apples to orangutans. Uh, 
they're different. The vertical flight capability, it's, it's now getting a new recognition, but, but it continues to be hard. They're very complex machines. They've still got wings, but they're rotary wings. And uh, I, it's frustrating that people don't recognize how hard they are, but in the end, the users don't care. They don't, they don't care how hard it is. They just want the capability. So it's on us to, to do it, to do it right, to make them safe, try and make them more affordable, but always make them safe. To inspire a young engineer to consider vertical flight as a career, um, you know, I'd ask if they're up for a challenge. Um, vertical flight, even as they try and simpl simplify it with electric power systems, is still immensely complicated. It's the confluence of structures and aerodynamics and dynamics and thermal uh, air breathing. Um, it's an incredible number of disciplines that must be integrated to solve the challenge. Um, as Sergei Sikorsky said, you know, the birds have it right. It's better to stop and then land and not the other way around. Um, so the capability is incredible. The challenges are hard. Um, it's funny when the fixed wing folks say their job is hard. Try rotating it at 400 RPM with Eight to twelve, eight hundred to twelve hundred G's at the tip, yeah. and we'll talk hard.